Hello, and welcome again to Talking Baseball with Leon Lee. Today is December 14th, 2020, and I'm here again with uh, my buddy Ryan, and my name is Steve. And today, Leon, we have a very special guest, and I'd like you to go ahead and introduce him. Well, good, Steve. I appreciate that. And uh, to keep it casual, this is not a guest for me. It's like family. Uh, one of very dear friends. We grew up pretty much together. I'm older and grayer. But uh, we graduated from the same high school, and we have today uh, Ricky Jordan. Uh, Ricky is a very special person. I mean, he's got had a great career in professional baseball. He was drafted as the number one pick out of Grant Union High School. And I think Ricky was 80, 1983 or two. 83. 1983. Yeah, yeah, I can remember that far. <laughs> and uh, went on and, and played eight years, nine years in the major leagues with the uh, Philadelphia Phillies and the Seattle Mariners. And I almost, he almost ended up going to Japan like I did. And, uh, but we, we're just so glad to have Ricky on and we're going to just get into it and start talking baseball. But first I want Ricky, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your career. Well, first of all, Leon, I appreciate you and Steve having me on. Uh, I'm glad we finally got this together. <laughs> And uh, I'll just start a little bit about the career. I mean, like you said, I graduated in 1983 out of Grant and, and uh, went on from there to play minor league baseball with the Phillies. Uh, started out uh, in Helena, Montana in rookie ball. Then went from there to Spartanburg, South Carolina. Woo! Then over to Clearwater, Florida. And then to Reading, Pennsylvania, double A. And then a little bit in Old Orchard Beach, Maine. Yeah, triple A. So I, I traveled it a little bit in the minor leagues, you know, but uh, yes. it was well worth the wait. Uh, put in a lot of hard work. And in uh, 1988 in July, I actually got called up. Uh, Mike Smith and Steve Carlton and all the guys were up with the Phillies at that time. And uh, wow. End up uh, being up in the big leagues July 17th, uh, my first game, and Nolan Ryan pitched. Oh, my God. And, and uh, they wouldn't let me play. They wouldn't let me play because they said, rookie, we don't want to break you in like that because they'll probably blow you away. And I says, hey, didn't Will Clark just hit a home run off him in his first at bat? You're not Will Clark. So I actually oh, didn't but... play that day. And the next day I started against Bob Neppert and I hit a three-run home in my first major league at bat against Bob Neppert the next day. So from then on, it was, it was golden. It was a dream come true. Boy, I tell you what, uh, hitting a home run your first at bat puts you in rare air. But then on the other hand, in, in, in defense of not playing against Nolan Ryan, I think, I don't know, I think maybe God might ask the manager to sit him down against Nolan. So There you go. <laughs> After that game, I was uh, pretty happy, Leon, because he struck out uh, 15, and I think he went about eight innings, and him and uh, – uh, Mike Smith was doing a little John. He pitched in on Mike Smith, and they were John at each other. I came up here to play baseball, not to fight. I thought, oh you know, my God, that's a great story. So yeah, uh, that's a great, great story. Yeah, Ricky, looking at your uh, statistics here on uh, Baseball Reference, you were a very consistent player with the Phillies for a good five, six years there. Yeah, I had a, I had a pretty good little run when I started out up there the first two or three years, and. Um, Ended up hurting my wrist a little bit, so sat out some games, and then they actually traded from San Diego and got John Cruck over there, and Cruck was playing left field, and he ended up hurting his knee. So next thing you know, uh, Lee Ilya and all them and uh, Jim Fogosi and all them, they said, well, we got to get Cruck in the lineup, so he plays first too. So, Ricky, you might have to learn how to play first base. I mean, left field, actually. Sorry about that, left field. Because Crux got to play and he's got to play first. So he got over to first and did so well. Next thing you know, I was <laughs> end up being a role player playing the outfield. <laughs> so kind of a little Wally Pip story on me, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I but guess you so. know, also people don't understand, like at the start of your story, Ricky, and we both went through it. You know, people, a lot of people think, well, you sign a contract to play pro baseball. You end up in Helena, Helena Montana. Yeah, you know all these little towns that people oh. don't realize how painful it is sometimes, and the long bus rides, and the, you don't get very much meal money, and you're not really making much money at all when you figure it out. It's 
actually below poverty wages when you only get paid six, seven months out of the year. Correct. And but but it, like you said, it's worth it. And then you finally break into the major leagues, and then all of a sudden your teammates with guys like you know Hall of Famers, and it makes it all it makes it all worth it. So yeah, that's a that's a that's a great story, and it's good for for kids to hear that because there's nothing given to you on a platter. Definitely not. I mean, you, you got to work for it. And like, I, like leaving, leaving home, you know, and heading to Mon Helena, Montana. I mean, the first time was, <laughs> you go to Helena, Montana, I still remember the day when the plane landed down in, inside all these mountains. I was going, where am I at? You know, exactly. I mean? It was uh, definitely a challenge, you know, being there with 40, 50 other uh, kids from, all different over, you know, all different places in the United States and from the islands, you know, Dominicans and, Puerto yep. Rico and Venezuelans and everybody. And then you're all, you're all fighting for the same thing. So it was definitely a challenge for me. Absolutely. And, and, you know, another thing I say, Ricky and Steve, Ryan, is that what are you made of when you hit those walls? Playing the game is one thing, but playing a game in, in a, a place that's not in your comfort zone seeing high level pitchers from all over the country, all over the world, you know, you're used to seeing a certain style pitcher and all of a sudden you're adapting. Now you kind of see what you're made of. And I think the lesson to kids is to learn, you know, that's why it's so important to learn how to compete because if you know how to compete, you could take the knowledge and the ability to compete anywhere. Right. But if you get intimidated and say, Oh my God, I don't belong here. You're going to hit a wall. I mean, it's, you're going to struggle and you go, well, people fail at different levels or they drop off. And a lot of it just simply because of lack of confidence that they can do it in those in those atmosphere. And I remember telling Derek, I said, when he first started, my son, he hit a wall at A-ball. He's all oh, pop A-ball is going to be easy. I'm going to kill A-ball. You know how we were with. We, yeah. I said, Derek, I said, D, you're going to hit a wall. What are you talking about, pop? What are you talking about? And then that next year and he like middle of May, he was hitting 130 with one home run and I said, okay, now what are you going to do? <laughs> and, and he figured it out. And the next thing you know, he got to the big leagues, but a lot of kids don't figure it out that way. So that's why it's important to, you know, that we talk about those type of things. Yeah, for sure. Yep. You're definitely right about that, Leon. And uh, I played with quite a few guys in the minor leagues that were really good players. And just like what Leon is saying, they lost confidence, you know what I mean? They, they'd have good years and then come back with a bad year and then they kind of gave up on it, you know? Yeah, exactly. If it's something you wanted to do, man, you got to get after it. I mean, I was just a diehard ball <laughs> I always wanted to do it. I said, I'm going I'm to give it my best shot to try to make it. And if I don't, then fine. But I'm gonna get, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, going out on my own without trying hard enough, you know what I mean? You're not kidding. Hey, we from Del Paso Heights, Ricky, man. You yeah. have to be a little tough. You got to figure it out. So, you know, nobody's right. going to tell you what to do all the time. You got to figure it right. out. So yeah. at, at that point, once you reach that level, uh, get into the pro level, is it is it true? I mean, it gets to a point where, you know, every ball player on the field has a lot of talent at that level. So then it becomes more of maybe who has the greater uh, mental and emotional capacity and skill set. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, it's it's the will and the extra work that you put in, you know, whereas like you said, we all pretty much we're all pretty much the same, you know, got the same uh type of talent, you know, going out there, but uh you just got to work harder. I mean, you got to stay extra and everything, extra time after the games and everything and keep working at it. So how does that, that translate that, to Go ahead, I'm your, sorry. Uh, your youth development, uh, Leon and Ricky, when you're trying to uh, coach the youth, uh, not only from the physical points of the game, but when you trying to teach the youth about that emotional and mental aspect of it to break through those barriers. Yeah, you know, the, the one thing that, and, and Ricky understands this as a professional, and I always say there's the biggest difference between a professional and an amateur. Um, number one, sometimes an amateur has a hard time doing the simple thing, where well, a professional makes the hard things look easy. And w one of the things we learn from repetition is number one is always show up. You know, some kids, they make excuses and they say, well, you know, they're not being honest with themselves. So if you're not performing well, then there's some excuse to get out of the game. 
if you know they they don't really feel white maybe they they'll show up late and maybe late means the coach might let might not put him in the lineup which is exactly what the kid wants him to do you know and the, the great players the great players the ones that turn out they challenge all those things they're always on time they always show up they always get their work in it's so it's one thing to be on time it's another thing to be ready and young kids, they got to understand, they show up and then prepare themselves. So when the game actually starts, you're prepared mentally and physically to play that game. And a lot of young kids don't, don't do that because they're expecting the coach to tell them everything. You know, there's a ball sitting right by your foot. You don't pick it up because the coach hasn't told you to pick it up yet. So the responsible player, the way kids should be taught is to take the accountability and responsibility because once you put that uniform on it's basically on you the kids that take that responsibility are the ones that move to the next level you know the ones that don't they they they, they end up being little league players or maybe even high school but they'll drop off and that's what separates it so hey like Leon. You, yeah it's 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 Ryan here. I'm sorry that uh my well, did you run to San Francisco my... and get back or what? <laughs> <laughs> what what was that, Leon? I thought maybe you drove to San Francisco and came back. Yeah, I'm still in Washington. It'd be okay. A, <laughs> a than that, but um, how you doing, Ryan? How's it going? I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing good, Ricky. It's 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 a pleasure to meet you and see you. I'm sorry I can't see you because my computer is not necessarily doing the best thing right now. But that's all right. well, that's okay. <laughs> we're we're you know? boys. I, I told Ryan, uh, uh, Ryan, go ahead and tell Ricky our relationship and make me sound good, okay? All right, let's see what I can do to make me sound good. All right, so. <laughs> oh, you had to think about right, Ricky, it. so basically um, I met Leon when I was 13 and uh, I'm 28 now, but uh, I was really shy. And uh, Leon always, you know, he always, he always pushed me because I was always looking over my shoulder and I was always, you know, checking who's in my corner what's going to happen, you know? And Leon's just like, focus on yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> focus on looking over your shoulder. Basically in the batting cages, that's what I'm referring to. Um, i referring to um, <clears throat> what you were just saying, Leon, you know, about wearing the numbers and everything and the name on your jersey. I think, I don't know. I think we mentioned this, you know, two podcasts ago, but um, it's what, you know, Kurt, when, okay, so obviously, in a nutshell, Ricky, I am a uh, very huge Dodger fan. So. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> we won't hold it against you. Hey, I know, you know, everyone does. I got a but, couple um, friends. I got a couple friends that are too, so it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so you know, I was listening to the radio, you know, a couple weeks ago when I was driving, and uh, there was a segment on the MLB radio, and it was about Tommy Lasorda. When Kirk Gibson first showed up in 88, 1988. Oh, also Steve Sachs was also the one of the or one of the commentators on the the radio show. So it, when you first meet Tommy Lasorda, you know, da, 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 what's gonna happen? And Tommy goes, the first thing Tommy says to them is like, You play for that name on the front of your shirt, not the yeah. back. Yeah. And you know, oh, yeah. it shows why he was a great manager. Yeah, that's him. That's so, him. Yeah. Boy, Tommy Lasorda was probably, or, I mean, he's still here, but, I mean, he's just, during the time he managed, he just had an amazing memory for things that happened in the game and names and and players. He could tell you what you did 10 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. He was. He was a good one. I know he hated uh, – when he came, they came into Philly to play us. Boy, the fanatic would always, you know, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. he'd run out on the field and grab his stuff and throw the fanatic stuff. Exactly. Oh, they they had yeah. that on video too. That's hilarious. Yeah. That's, That's hilarious. definitely a baseball blooper right there for you. <laughs> yeah. But you know, Ricky, that's the time when the uh, the game was so entertaining. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the transition of what's happening now in the game is is so uh, analytical and, you know, so many, so mechanical terminology, I think has taken the real fun out of the game. Kids aren't learning how just to express themselves and laugh. I don't see any kids laughing on the baseball field anymore and uh, just really having fun. I mean, I know it's not fun in games, but it still should be fun. 
<laughs> you know. Yeah, you're right. You're definitely right. I mean, you know, in today's today's baseball game, it's very different. You know, what I mean, with the way they teach the game, this launch angle and all this different. Degree. Oh my God! I mean, they can't even. I mean, you watch some games and. You got a guy at first and second. They can't even get a guy over without no outs bunt. No, they don't know how to bunt. They don't know how to do nah. anything. They've all been taught to swing for the fences. That's why I guess last year there was more strikeouts than there were hits, I think. It, you know? it, you're right. So it's, it's just taught. The game's taught really different with all the analytics and stuff. And it takes away from the basic fundamentals of the ABC baseball that we were taught when we came through little league, and then the way you the way you taught kids how to play the game too. Yes, yeah, and we we all like, I mean, Ricky Jordan knew how to launch a ball. He didn't know anything about launch angle. He right. just knew how to launch it because when he hit it, it was launched. But also, Ricky Jordan knew how to hit the ball the other way. Ricky Jordan knew how to put a bunt down when he needed it. Because when we were growing up, we learned every aspect of the game. You know, I'm in big league camp coaching with Chicago Cubs, and we're out there with major league players teaching them how to slide. Now, do you ever remember not knowing how to slide? There wasn't a day that I ever took the field that I didn't go home dirty. You made up a slide. You could slide to the left. You could slide to the right. You could slide (laughs) straight in. You (laughs) You could slide and pop up. Yeah. You know, if you got one of them big old bruises on your strawberry on your right hip, you just slid on your left hip. Yeah. But that was, the, but that was, <laughs> our, way, that was our way in El Paso Heights of uh, playing slippery slide. That's how we got wet and got entertainment. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly right. But see, that's what made guys have fun. You know, they would challenge things. You know, I'm going to take the extra base on you. No, you're not. I dare you to. It, it didn't always have to be verbal. So as soon as you got on first, you looked out there, you go, you know, I'm running. Yeah. And so the challenge was always on. It was always a challenge for everything. And now the game has gotten real complacent. You see balls bounce in the dirt from the pitcher to the catcher. In our day, that ball bounce in the dirt, you're gone. You're gone. Yeah. You're so, gone. Yeah. So Ricky, so, here's a question that we we've talked to Leon about on, on many podcasts. It's kind of a big question, I know, but when you're teaching youth or some of the younger kids uh, the game, um, what are some of the things that, that you emphasize, you know, in general, you, you know, whether you're talking hitting or fielding or whatever, what, what do you, what areas of the game do you like to emphasize with the youth these days? Well, first of all, I like to instill confidence in them because today's youth, there's not nothing against parents or anything, but today's youth, there's some kids out there, that probably shouldn't even be out there. You know what I mean? Their parents put them out there just because. Amen. They want them out. You know what I mean? They just want them out of the house or whatever. You know what I mean? But but in reality, the ones that want to be out there, I teach it. I would start with confidence with them. Then start with the basics of uh, understanding the game and get a little grasp for the game and loving the game and also letting them know that you don't really have to have talent to hustle. I mean, you know what I mean? Everybody can come out there and hustle. You don't have to have that talent to hustle. And the good ones, the good ones are going to keep striving for it and working at it hard anyway. And I think even, even the ones that don't have the talent could actually strive to do it. You know what I mean? There's so many guys that made it to the major leagues that were projected never to make it. You know what I mean? They got exactly. drafted. Uh, some didn't get drafted. They just worked hard. I mean, one in particular is Fernando Vigna. Look at, look at, Little Fernando Vina, F.P. Santangelo, these guys, they weren't great players and weren't supposed to even make it, and they did, you know what I mean? Even Jimmy Rollins was a decent player, but he's a little guy, you know what I mean? And he That's made right. It. I, just, I just like instilling confidence and studying the game a little bit to the kids. At a young age, they can understand the game, you know what I mean? They can understand the game. Yeah, I agree with that because, you know, one thing, you know, to counter on that, the bill on that, Ricky, is that you see nowadays, too, with the parents, you know, you mentioned parents and parents create, I think what they're, the problem they do is they create tension because the expectations are so high for these kids. The parents are saying, oh, yeah, my son's doing this and he's doing that. And, right. and on the field, to me, there's the there's a difference between and me and Steve. And we've talked about this between tense and intense. And if you start teaching kids how to become intense, it's in the, it's more in your core. 
whereas tense is in your shoulders and, and you get nervous and they squint in eyes. And I always tell kids, hey, relax and open your eyes. You open your eyes really wide, like a, like a boxer, you know, they, they can see things when they open their eyes and it shows that they're not tense. You know, and another thing is that in the batter's box, and we always talk hitting, they're teaching these kids, boy, if you don't get a hit, you're a total failure. And instead of teaching the kids how to enjoy the process, you know, me and Rhino, I used to teach Rhino a lot. It's, it's really the process. And, the, and by, by not getting a hit, it brings in tension. And you say, I got to get a hit. I got to get a hit. And as soon as you start saying, I got to, it creates more tension. You know, and so when you're teaching kids how to deal with that failure, the way coaches and parents aren't letting kids deal with failure anymore. Right. Doggone it. If we if you would have got a hit right there, we'd have won the game. Oh, my God. (laughs) You know, (laughs) those are things that has to be discussed and saying we got to put the uniform on and go out there and play the game. Don't worry about results. Right. Right. Have some fun with it. Yeah, because. I mean, as you know, Leon hitting is tough anyway, and it's a failure. <laughs> always, you know, he's saying, hey, three out of ten, I'm failing, but I'm a good hitter. I'm considered that, a good hitter in this. That's like, right. I mean, he goes, it's hard to hit a baseball. You know what I mean? It moves sure all over the place, coming that fast, and you only got a certain amount of time to react to it. You know, it, it's tough. It's really you tough. You better believe it. What's the old saying? You got a round ball, a round bat, and you're trying to hit it square. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Right, Rhino? Yeah, no, I totally knew you were going to say that. <laughs> you know, and I, I, That's I'm the a, old I'm saying. Old I'm <laughs> I, it, it always works. See the ball, hit the ball. Yeah, there you go. There you you go. know, it goes back to the basics. And I always try to – tracking the ball is hard for kids when they're worried about seeing their elbow and they're seeing where their feet are. Because subconsciously, if somebody's told you all these mechanical things and you get in a batter's box – you know, subconsciously, those are the things you're seeing instead of actually putting all your all your concentration on tracking that ball. You could literally slow the ball down, huh, Ricky? If, yeah. If you know, I don't care how hard a guy's throwing, if you're really locked into him and everything slows down, you can track that ball right in the zone. Then your natural instincts take over. Yeah, I mean, like you said, if you're in that you're in that box thinking about everything they told you. Oh, get this elbow up. Get this. Get that next. The balls are in the glove. It's body. That's right. <laughs> You know, and that. then the coaches say, "You didn't do what I told you to do." <laughs> you <Yeah>. know. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. Right. a lot exactly. of could be said for a simplification at some point after you learn the fundamentals. Yeah, and and really, when you step in that box, it it doesn't become a mechanical thing anymore. It becomes an emotional thing. You know, you're dealing with emotions. If you're playing in a in a game, Ricky hit a three run homer in his first major league at bat. And probably, probably, I would guess more than 30,000 people there. It was right. probably on somebody's television. But when Ricky stepped in that batter's box, he's going, hey, this is where I belong. Yeah. He didn't say, oh, my God, Bob Nepper's on the phone. On the, while I was reading about him last week, he's got a great curveball. You just psyched yourself out. You know? right. yeah. Instead of saying, no, no, I belong here. And if he yeah. hangs something, he's in trouble. Definitely. <laughs> you know? And actually, <laughs> Took a plan, took a plan, you know, watching him pitch to Mike Smith, some other people from on deck, you know what I mean? Took a plan up there with what I wanted to do. And that, there you that go. Out. I already knew kind of what I was looking for and what I wanted yep. to do. You got to have some kind of plan. But see what you just said, Ricky? You had a plan that what you were going to do based on what you saw. You weren't sitting up there wondering what your batting stance was like. Correct. That's what I'm talking about. Now you're into the game mode. You're thinking, what is this pitcher trying to do? And what am I going to do to get my best swings, right. you know? And uh, it's not about the mechanical part then. And that's where we have to, you know, they, they kind of say old school, new school. It's, it's all baseball. Right. And, you know, if you get the great hitters in the game now, I can guarantee their thought processes are just like they were when Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle and them guys played. Right. You know, so, I mean, Willie Mays overstrode. Roberto yeah. Clemente stepped all in the bucket. Yeah. Hank Aaron was a glider, yeah. but they all kept them hands back. Back. I would... <laughs> kept them back and had confidence. Had confidence it, it, up it, there, too. You know what I mean? Exactly and right. Was not afraid to fail because you can't Ooh. be afraid to fail at this game because you're You can't be afraid. You're absolutely right. Can't afraid. Can't be. I don't even pretty much like using that word because if you make it out, you just made it out. Yeah. And uh, but I, I look at the quality of that bat and I said, did I get 
done what I want to do. I mean, I can make an out, but was I patient? Would I, would I see the ball? Sometimes I just got to tilt my hat to the pitcher and said, okay, you made a pretty decent pitch. Cause you know, what are we taught to hit? We hit mistakes. Correct. Pitcher make a mistake. We make them pay for it. If they don't yep. make a mistake, you tip your hat and, you know, go about your business. Yep. See you next <laughs> when I come back up here. That's, right. hey, there you go. Yeah. Can't okay. wait till next time. Well, I hate to do this to you guys, but I think we're kind of running short on time, but we can definitely see how fast it goes. We can yeah. definitely continue. Yeah. We can definitely can continue this. Mm -hmm. Um, after we end this one here. So um, I think Ryan wanted to end it with a quick trivia question for you guys. Ryan, do you have that ready? Yeah, I got a couple of them ready. Um, oh. So, uh, all right, let's see. So, all righty. So who was the youngest player to be inducted into the Hall of Fame? The youngest player to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Ricky? Leon, do you guys know his name? I mean, you Kirk? obviously know his name, but... <laughs> um, well, was it Ricky Henderson? No. <laughs> you I get... When you said Ricky, I thought you were giving a hint Rick... with Ricky Jordan. Rick... No, I'm sorry. I'm, I was asking you and Ricky, Leon. Oh, oh I know. <laughs> youngest, Ken Griffey was... Oh, it was Ken Griffey. How about uh, giving a quick hit here? Uh, maybe a, a hint, uh, Ryan, about maybe the era? All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and uh, all right. The youngest. I'll say. I'll say. You know, he played in the sixties. Oh, played youngest. Sixties. Played in the sixties, huh? Huh. Uh, in what position? Outfielder. I like if I give away the position. Outfielder. What's that, Ricky? Outfielder. All right. I'll be honest. He's a pitcher. Oh, a pitcher. Whoa. Juan Marichal? No. And played in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Oh, a oh, Hall of Famer, though. I'm thinking of a young pitcher, but he wasn't in the Hall of Fame. Um, 60. Played in the 60s. That would be Warren Spahn. Think about uh, who had to retire early. Oh, Sandy Koufax. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Liam, you got it. <laughs> Yeah. Why didn't I know it was a doctor? Yeah, yeah. and you just talking about the sword and all of them, and we should have got that. Either. We should have got that, huh? Yeah. I know, right? So there's more than uh, just Dodger trivia questions, but I wanted to give one tonight. So <laughs> that's a good one, Ryan. <laughs> well, that was a pretty good trivia question there, Ryan, about Sandy Koufax. I think you uh, stumped both Ricky and Leon there for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's only because I'm a biased Dodger fan. <laughs> That's right. Well, we we won't blame you, but but the, you know the Dodgers are have been a storied uh, a storied franchise, and when you talk about Drysdale and Colfax and all those guys that played with the Dodgers, Lasorda, those are always great stories. But uh, coming back to here, I, I just can't thank Ricky Jordan enough for joining us tonight, today, and uh, like he said, maybe you know we we have some other potential local superstar get ex baseball players to that connected to and and ricky uh, again i can't thank you enough for being on well leon i appreciate you steve and ryan having me on it was it was a blast uh anytime we can talk about some baseball i'm in on it. Uh, <laughs> I guess we'll reach out to a couple other fellas and see if uh they're interested in getting on the podcast with us that's wonderful again thanks again and uh you guys steve and ryan hey you guys take care of yourself through this uh, COVID thing. We got vaccines coming out now. So I think we got to, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. So just be safe. I agree. All you guys be safe, Steve and Ryan and you too, Leon. Okay. Well, thanks again, uh, Ricky, for joining us tonight. Again, it was a pleasure meeting you and uh, hearing about a little bit about your career. And of course, we're going to have you on many more times in the future. So we'll get to hear a lot more stories, uh, all right, so I'll just uh, remind everybody that you could find our podcast on probably where you're listening here at uh, Talking Baseball with Leon Lee at uh, .podbean.com. And you could also find us on Spotify and Google Podcasts just by searching Talking Baseball with Leon Lee. And again, the email address is talkingbaseballwithleonlee at gmail.com. And we'll talk to you all again soon.